ready if you can take it away please thanks yeah thanks uh, thanks for that greg um it should be on the screen for everybody and uh, just to add one other thing is that there will be opportunities to to go into detail of your specific uh requ requirements as in one-to-ones should you need to do that but and but we'll jim will go, probably go through that later okay um the, the, the actual presentation this evening, there's a bit of an introduction about the PWI, which I, I'm going to go through quite quickly because most of you will know about the PWI. That's why we're here tonight. But I just want to co cover some of that part of it and then we'll go into the process of what registration involves, what it is and what benefits there are for you as a self. OK, the, the PWI there, that gives that's what we do. That's what we're here tonight. We we also provide training courses. We provide journals, technical seminars, conferences, and you've got your conference in Glasgow tomorrow. But don't forget the training courses which are run by the PWI. We do um, diploma in uh, modules three, one, two, and three in a track diploma as well. So there's there's uh, you go on the website and have a look what that we do, and it's past history established a long long time ago in 1884 uh, and I think one of the key things there is the third bullet because things start to change in 2016 when we started to qualify track engineers to become full members of engineering council and now we've got 280 registered engineers at all levels CN chartered engineer incorporated engineer and engineering technician as well we are a broad community. We we cover railway infrastructure engineering and and um, uh, and hopefully there are some overhead line uh, and plant people on tonight as well. And they're covered by uh, in, under the umbrella of the PWI. We've got our own website, social media, meetings, seminars, publications, as I've said before. You've probably come across most of those. The community itself, I mentioned that before, Nearly all engineers are represented in some way in the PWI. I'm a, I'm a civil engineer, uh, a fellow of the institution of civil engineers and a fellow of the uh, permanent way institution. And there's a lot of people who've got dual membership and there's also people who are from the mechanicals and there is from the um, IE uh, electricals as well. So there's we've got building engineers, we've got geotech engineers who also form part of um, and, and turn up at meetings and attend courses or whatever. This is an important one, I think. This is the important one because what we're talking about tonight covers all other institutions as well. We, in 1981, the Engineering Council became the regulatory body for UK engineering profession. Yeah, and that covered all the the institutions that were there from 1818, which was the ICE, the IMACE 1847, and the IEE, uh, which is in 1871. And we joined as PWI joined it in 2007, as we saw there before, uh, 16, I should say. There are now another 37 specialist institutes, but we all have to work through the, the UK specification of the Engineering Council. So what you see tonight is the same as whether you were joining the ICE, similar, I should say, to what the ICE is, to the, what the IMEC is, the same process that we go through. There might be some tweaks on the way, but the same process generally. The grades, this, this, the grades are you can join um, and become part of the Engineering Council and the PWI um, registration as an engineering technician, as an, as an incorporated engineer, and generally, as it says there, your application will be based on current and developing track technology and may undertake engineering design. That's just an example of what incorporated engineers might do. Engineering technicians, they, you, you contribute to the solutions of, of practical engineering problems. You actually carry them out. Chartered engineers develop solutions to complex engineering problems using new or existing technologies. Same levels in all the other institutions as well. 
And, and here we're just talking about uh, what we talked about bef uh, before. I've just introduced the engineering technician, incorporated engineer, whatever. The important thing is probably what's in block capitals at the bottom. You know, when you're going for professional registration, and, Rob, and Jim will cover this, pro I'm sure, in more detail later when he talks about how people apply and become actually at the interviews or whatever their submission is. It's not a job interview. OK, so it's not just based on your experience and it's not just based on any academic academic knowledge that you've got. We need to know that really you've got the understanding of what you are doing. So you've got competency and you've got commitment as well. But we, you, you obviously need some academic knowledge. You need some, but you also need experience and competence and commitment. What are the benefits of being a chartered engineer? Well, it, it's interesting that um, I was doing reviews for the ICE yesterday, and I've heard this a lot of times when I've been doing reviews for the PWI and ICE, is that nowadays, employers uh, want their staff to be members of an institution and that's because clients actually ask the employers to have people who are members of institutions as well so you get but you also get international recognition because these levels are recognized throughout the world you've got your letters against you know your name and you enjoy high up earning potential. I'd like to say you could walk out with one of these and be able to say that you could go and get a 10% pay rise, but you can't. I can't guarantee any of that, but I have to say it has helped me. And in general, it, what you'll find is at least it gets you an interview. So it gives you access to a framework of support throughout the infrastructure, throughout the, um, in, in, uh, the, the organizations themselves. Uh, academically wise, uh, this may not mean much to everybody, but um, it, it doesn't matter. I'll kind of come into a bit more detail on this later. But uh, for, the, for those who have probably qualified in, in the last 10 years, you'll recognize these. Eng Tech, typically level three learning. IEng, incorporate engineer, they're generally coming in as a bachelor's level of degree and a chartered engineer. It, they they would be coming in um, at a master's level of learning, but we'll, I'm going to it's it's a master's level of learning. It doesn't mean that you've actually got a master's degree, and I'll I'll show you how that works as well, or a bachelor's degree. When we talked before about professional competence and commitment, it's about knowledge. It's about these are the criteria that we we we're looking for. So it's knowledge and understanding of engineering. It's been able to show that you can do some sort of design, development, solving engineering problems. You don't have to have done design, but you may under, may be about understanding design or have been involved in, in carrying out some of it. You need to be able to show responsibility, management and leadership. Now, it depends on what level you are, are applying for, but we're not just talking about the engineering side of it. We're talking about a rounded engineer. We're needing some. We need people who have got communication, interpersonal skills, personal and professional commitment. Now, don't be scared away by any of that. You do it. You probably don't realise you're doing it, but you are actually carrying out a lot of those duties. And you'll be surprised how easy it is to find that information and that experience. So let's just assume that we're all wanting to now decide to become. Uh, registered at whatever ever level it is that we would like to enter. You need to be a member of the PWI. You'll need a sponsor and a supporter. Now, a supporter is somebody who generally is somebody that you work with, who, who can sort of say, yeah, that's the, 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 they're the sort of people that would appear on any evidence that you put forward, their initials would appear perhaps on it. You, you need a sponsor. A sponsor is somebody who's and um, it, it's already registered with Engineering Council at whatever level, yeah, but they've been through it so they can actually guide you through the process. Now, if you can't find a sponsor or a support, well, a sponsor, you will have supporters, but if you can't find a sponsor, the PWI will find you, help you find a sponsor, okay? So that's somebody who will help you through the process. 
You'll need your continuous professional development records being kept up to date and have a current personal development plan. Now that, you know, everybody should be doing that anyway. And you are doing it. You are actually doing CPD um, um, uh, studies all the time when you're at work, you're going on training courses and, you, you know, you may be reading things uh, or watching programs on television. I'll, I'll talk some of that later on as well. For ING and CNG, you need to check that your route to registration and if there's a, you need to check if there's an academic gap and I'll show you that. And you'll obviously need to prove that you've got the certificates for whatever it is you're applying for. I mentioned supporter and sponsors. There's a bit of definition about them. Somebody knows you, regularly works with you, could be line manager and a sponsor. And I've mentioned that already. Don't have to be, um, a PW, uh, sorry, um, uh, with the, even with the PWI, but they need to be with the engineering council, ideally with the PWI, because that you, they know what they, they've been through it and they can help you through the whole process. Okay, uh, that was just a, a now the journey. Okay, right now we go through the journey. Now we'll go through the actual more into the process itself. So let's say, for instance, you were applying to become an Eng Tech. You'd complete the ap application form, which is shown there. It's on the website, yeah, and it just demonstrates that you can um, comply with those competencies I showed you before, A to E. If you remember those five competencies. And you'll engage with your sponsor and they'll help you through that process. They'll point you in the right directions and you'll be discussing what what experience evidence you'll need. You'll provide some supporting evidence, um, not more than 12 A4 sheets, which will be your appendices and things like that. Or it could be with it could have some A3 pages. All of that is evidence of what you've done. Yeah, you'll provide your cu your current personal development plan and one year's CPD records, and then you'll submit it to the PWI. And within six weeks, you get a a response. It's done. Um, it, it, you know, there's no no interview for Eng Tech. You you put, you submit it, and then we uh, review it, and and then we get back to you with, as it says there, either the pass or a resubmission with. You need to uh, explain a little bit more about this, a bit more to fill in some of the uh, areas that we can't perhaps picture what you're saying uh, is, is to us. So there's those competencies I mentioned before. Yeah, knowledge and understanding of uh, 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 knowledge and understanding. And, and there's a box on there. You'll fill in 700 words describing elements of your work and what you do. Or what you did explain or explain how a system or some equipment works uh, design could be examples where you've used measurement monitoring assessment you you can read through those there there are these are the sort of things that you would these are the questions that you will be filling in and those boxes will be answering those types of um, core questions yeah so communication and interpersonal skills, 400 words. You'll you'll want to be demonstrating where you've carried out oral written communication of technical information at all levels. Uh, you, you will be doing it. You'll do it at certain whenever you've got meetings, you will provide that sort of uh, communication to your staff, to maybe just colleagues or on a on a, on a possession at night or whatever. Uh, and a key one nowadays is de de demonstrate awareness of diversity and inclusion issues. Personal and professional commitment, uh, you, you know, you, you will uh, put 700 words, which show what other things that you carry out outside your working life. And that could be, um, uh, for instance, tonight's uh, meeting. Uh, and it is also there, as you see, safe methods of working safety and, and uh, is important part of it you must be able to show that in our profession that you are applying safe methods of work and you will have to give evidence of that as well okay for ing or cng chartered engineer or incorporated engineer you will already probably have academic qualifications right now don't worry if you haven't because I'll show you some routes that you can carry out to to uh, reach those levels, fill those gaps. But if you've got uh, an incorporated engineer, a bachelor's degree, that means you can go straight and apply for uh, ING. If there's a gap in your qualifications, then 
um, you, we, you will, you actually would write, there's a form you fill in with your qualifications on it. It's only a couple of pages. You say what you're, you were aiming for. You say your existing qualifications. That goes to the academic panel. The academic panel, which I, I'm a member of the academic panel, we look at what these, the academic um, requirements are, and we look at the gap in the knowledge, and we can could then suggest how you can fill that gap. Yeah. And then if you you got all that, you're ready, you would then go for a, you provide a professional review report, 5,000 words to demonstrate you have the experience and competencies A to E, which we mentioned before in the previous two couple of slides. And you'll submit your application with a report. Uh, and again, with you may have room for the, there's 12 A4 uh, pages of appendices if you want, or three A3 as well, or and or it should be. And then we get what happens is they go to um, the the uh, to H HQ, the, the scrutineers look at it to make sure all the evidence is there to start the process to move to interview. You attend an interview, and um, and then we either say where you are or what you need to do next. Now you may be interested in this particular one here. This is a a key one that actually shows you the routes, the various routes uh, that you can go to actually get qualification. Now you've got to bear in mind here is that what we're saying here this is for ING registrations so if you if you're um, uh, sorry ENG tech registration I can't see because the bars in the way at the top um, yeah it is it's uh, N is it yeah sorry no ING, ING yeah so you start there if you've got no formal qualifications you can still apply for it via the technical report route OK, um, then if you've got a HNC, you could go via the experiential learning. These these parts here, these parts in the middle are how you fill the gap between the level of a qualification that you have at the moment and to get to the point where you could actually submit your professional development experience report and then go for the reviews. All right. So as it says here, that one there, if you go in French tech, you just provide your, your, your uh, level three qualifications or whatever. You can then write your report and then you get reviewed and, and get to know what the outcome is directly without having to go to interview. Through our ING and CENG, there's, uh, those are the routes that you can go. All right. Now there's more than that. There's more, more route. No, it depends really about what your qualifications are. Yeah, and you can imagine there's people come up with uh, a variety of qualifications, but we can help you decide which is the best route. The important thing is if you've got the bachelor's degree or you've got a chartered degree uh, on this side here, you can go forward to charter to chartership straight away. If you haven't, then there's these parts here which will help you get to that point. So you could end up writing a technical report you could go back to university you could go back to college and fill up the gap by acad academic knowledge or you could write a technical report or you could go through the experiential learning which is people generally who've got well I'll, I'll show you the that's usually about at least five years experience on the railway there and then you've got pwi track de design a diploma which will help you to actually move through that route as well so ING, if you're going for ING, the technical report, we've been through, you get your sponsor, you produce your and submit a 500 word synopsis. And you then, um, uh, this is this is actually, going back to one here, this is this, I'm going into this one here, the technical report. So you've got perhaps no formal education or you need to top it up. A HNC may need to have a, a top up of technical report. And for a technical report, you would write a 5,000 to 10,000 word technical report, which fills that gap to of the technical or academic side of it from your experience. Now, you don't jump straight in. You write a 500 word synopsis and there's guidance on how to do that. That gets agreed as being a good basis for doing your report. And then you can do carry out a technical report. 
That's then passed um, to the reviewers. They review it and following acceptance of your technical report, you could then you've then got the same academic status of though of anybody else going for that particular level of, of uh, ING or yeah. So that and gives you a bit of background to that one there. For ING, there's an individual route, um, the P PWI uh, diploma uh, and report. Now this is this is only in the last 12 months, 18 months that we've actually now we've got people who are going from HND or foundation engineer to ING and they can do this by if they've been on the PWI diploma, the four mod, the three module diploma, which I've mentioned previously, and you, you complete the three modules and pass that. And then there's a short supplementary report to reflect on your learning and then two assessors agree that the learning output Puts that you've uh, outcomes are sufficiently demonstrated to fill that technical gap and then it, the academic panel ratifies that recommendation and then you progress to professional review so this is another way that you can actually uh, if you haven't got the uh, the the um, the qualifications to go straight to the route that you want these are some of the ways that you can fill that up and that's the uh, the PWI diploma report route now, I mentioned also there was the experiential learning. It says there it's in pilot in, and um, it's, this is to fill the gap from HNC yeah, to ING. Now, typically you're going to need at least five years experience working at the, an ING type of level. You're going to involve section four sections of, of filling in those four sections, Ex engineering theory and principles, design and innovation, project management, ethical and societal values. Now, if you if you go on the website, you'll be able to see a submission paper that you have to fill in. You fill in this question, those four questions, and there's a reflection paragraph at the end on what you've done. You are you include your CP, your CPD, your CV and your project, um, your uh, development plan. Uh, and there's there's no assessment and ass you do get sorry, no interview, but you get a reviewed uh, in by two assessors. And then once you've had the assessments have been um, uh, sufficient, you can then progress to professional review. And if they're not sufficient, the the the, um, the assessors will tell you what you need to do to fill it in to fill that gap. So if you're going for chart, this is the same uh, diagram we saw before, but this is if you're going down the route of chartered engineer. So previously we've talked about Eng Tech, that's the route straight through that right there. With ING, well, you may need you may need some other uh, uh, help with the, the ones that we showed you on the previous one. Now with with CENG, there are two additional routes that sorry parts that can fill in those gaps. You can either go straight there with a master's degree, right? So you've got the professional development, you can write the report, in you go straight away. Or you can actually do via experiential learning to fill in that ac academic gap and technical report, which you can then put with your professional development experience. Yeah. So um, again, it's there's the experiential route and there's a technical report report route. Here's the technical report route. Same process again, 5,000 to 10,000 words of showing how you've got that technical knowledge on a particular subject that you've worked with, knowledge and understanding gained through experience in the industry. You start with a 500 work synopsis just to make sure that you don't go down the wrong route and then we can help you with that. And then you attend and pass a technical report interview. And following that, um, two scrutineers see your 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 submission and then you go to academic status you can go forward to professional review so here you've got the um, you've reached the academic status now you're going to go for your professional review the experiential route as I said before same sort of thing you need five years plus experience uh, and and then there's um, the, the the you, you fill in these levels here uh, rather than one specific technical subject or number of subjects you 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 fill a, a, a wider variety of um, entries and um, then with your cv your cpd you can then go for assessment by two assessors 
on the technical side of it, you uh, fill that gap and then you can progress to professional review. OK, so you're the same way there. Professional development plan. Now, we've, we've, I've shown you the routes to get in there. What you do need to do is you need CPD, con continuous professional development. <coughs> you probably come across this in, in your work anyway. If you haven't, you need a professional development plan that you've got for yourself. You know, where are you headed? What is it? You, where are you trying to get to? You know, and and to, where, if that is where I want to be, I want to be this certain level or I want to be in doing this type of work. You will need to um, develop skills in that area or maybe improve the skills you've got now. And, and that will be done via having short and long term goals, which will involve some sort of technical um, uh, de development trait, development courses or whatever that you set yourself. Here's the various ways you can get. You're looking for 30 hours per year. That isn't that much when you think about it. You know, um, this is classed as being a CPD. There's uh, there's any of you, your uh, your meetings that you go to the PDBI are classed as C, a CPD. And if you're on the course tomorrow, there's probably six hours of CPD that you're going to get. You can soon build it up, but you can do self learning, distant learning, TV documentaries. Yeah, you could get it from the anything from the Internet. It's reading as long as you record what you did and what you learned. That's what you need to be able to show more aspects of CPD. It could be about uh, here. We're going into details about different parts of the engineering, project management, contract law. You know, maybe the, the next job you're you're going to you're going to be involved more directly in, in contracts. You want to know a bit more about it and you're learning that on your own or seeing other people or going on a course. Maybe I don't know. Even more aspects, more aspects of so there's site visits, presentations or whatever. OK, so your CPD is really important. You should be you've probably got it now. You need to the the the, um, the PWI has a a, a uh, online uh, tool that you can use for your CPD or whatever you have yourself. But you do need to keep recording it because you'll need that for when you submit. Finally, when we go into the last parts of it, there's the PWI code of conduct. <coughs> We, do, we need to make sure we, we uh, in anything we're doing, these are things that you would normally want do anyway, but you need to be aware that honesty and integrity matter when you're, when you, when you're going to become a member of the engineering council, these sort of things that we are, are expected. You only undertake work you're competent to do. That's an important one. You know, there's no there's no shame in saying I don't understand this, but there is problems if you actually take on stuff which you don't. So how you have full regard for public interest, you show due regard to the environment. That's those are becoming the big issues at the moment and you continue in your professional knowledge. But health and safety, welfare are, are very, very key in, in our industry and diversity as well. Are, they're part of the PWI code of conduct. So that's where we are. That's what we're trying to do. That's where you're trying to get to is become part of the the engineering council as as, as through the PWI. Right. I've uh, I'll close that down and move back to the start here. Greg, is it you that uh, is, is is or is it over to Jim now? Yeah, just straight over to Jim if you're that's happy with great. that. Jim, yeah, yeah, that's right. Unless there's any questions that people wanted to raise now, I just want to go straight into it, Jim. OK, I'm I'm quite happy to uh, start straight away, providing yep. no, no burning questions for you, Brian. OK. OK, uh, can you all see my screen? Yep. Hopefully the answer is yes. Yeah. Yes, we can, Jim. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK, that's fine. Firstly, a very brief introduction. For those uh, who don't know me, uh, my name is Jim Watson. Uh, I'm a chartered civil engineer. I became chartered with the ICE in 1990. Uh, at that time, I worked in the bridge office, BR bridge office in Glasgow. Uh, and I have to say that uh, becoming registered now as an engineering professional uh, is maybe not easier, but it's a lot more sensible. Uh, I think that's that's something to bear in mind because it's a lot more sensible, it's a lot more relevant to what you do. 
Uh, sadly, this year it's 50 years uh, anniversary of being in the infrastructure industry. Not all of them in the railway, but the, 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 the vast majority. I've been a reviewer for the PWI since 2019. So I have a number of reviews under my belt. And I'm also a, a member of the PWI's membership committee, which kind of gives me the privilege of seeing every single uh, application for professional registration that comes through. Uh, and it's very useful to me as a reviewer because it helps me calibrate myself as, as part of the review process. Uh, professional registration uh, is a recognition that your knowledge, your understanding and competence meets uh, the internationally recognised standard for the profession and that you're committed to keeping these up to date and uh, acting both with integrity and the public interest. Uh, as Brian has already said, uh, what we're doing is uh, reviewing your competence and commitment to test and confirm compliance with the Engineering Council's UK spec. Now, what we are doing at all stages of the review is a peer review. Uh, I'll jump down uh, two steps. It's not the Spanish Inquisition. It is a professional peer review. The review itself, uh, whether it's a desktop review or an interview, enables you to demonstrate how you meet the competence and commitment standards. The review format varies between the registration grades. For EngTech, the review is undertaken as a desktop exercise without the need for an interview. However, uh, if you want to have an interview, you you can, there is nothing to prevent you having a professional interview for EngTech. Nobody seems to want to take that up, of course. Uh, for iEng and CEng, it's a desktop review followed by a professional interview. Your reviewers will be professional engineers with experience uh, in your specific fields of expertise and background. Uh, when you fill in your application form, there's a little matrix on there where you put down your areas of experience uh, and your background, whether that be with a design house, uh, with a client or with a contractor. Uh, the reviewers also fill in a very similar interview so that when it comes time for a review, we can actually match uh, as best we can uh, interviewer and interviewee. Um, one thing that will happen is that your interviewer will not be somebody who is uh, working with you or closely professionally known to you. We obviously we have issues with uh, unconscious bias. For, for, for example, I, I might be handed an application and go, oh, great, that, that, that lassie uh, worked for me for a period as a graduate trainee. She was really keen, keen as mustard, wanted to learn, really competent, made a great cup of tea. Now, am I going to fairly judge that? Similarly, uh, I could be handed an application and say, oh, that chap was a project engineer uh, on, on the, that project I was working on. He came along to design reviews. He sat there and said, not a, not a thing, and then murdered you on the DRM comments. Again, would I be able to be objective and fair to that? Obviously not. Uh, your reviewers will have undertaken appropriate initial training, refresher training, and we are subject to regular audit. Before moving on to discuss the review itself, a few key points. It's really, really important that this is all about you. In your reports and in your application forms, I expect to see the words I and my a lot because it is about you. However, we appreciate that it's inevitable that you will have worked as part of a team. What we're interested in is the part you played, not what the team did. What 
I'd be looking for uh, in, in a response would be perhaps uh, I was a member of a team that did whatever, uh, and the part I played in the team was I influenced the team's recommendations by. So things like that is it's centered round about you. Now, one of the things you need to remember is that uh, competence and commitment requirement D1 requires that you communicate effectively with others at all levels in English. So it's imperative that you check your spelling. Now, the application forms uh, are all now in Word format, so that's fairly easy to do, uh, provided, of course, you switch on the UK English rather than American English. You check the grammar, you check the logic, because spell checker won't, won't be a word checker, check the logic of what you're saying. And what I don't expect to see is the word I in lowercase, because that just jumps right out at you. I appreciate that uh, nowadays people communicate by text. I've got big fat fingers and uh, little keys in my, my telephone keypad, so I, I, I tend not to do that quite as much. I, I know people tend to forget grammar and the like when they're, they're communicating by text, but here, please, Check it, check it again. Uh, every applicant must demonstrate their ability to apply safe systems of work and understand the safety implications of their role. Uh, that's question E2, uh, and it's common throughout uh, all registration levels. Uh, it's a place where I would actually expect people to talk about CDM, about risk assessments, rather than perhaps site-based uh, issues. CDM, after all, is the law of the land, and it's unfortunately an area where a lot of people don't really appreciate the roles of the client, the designer, and the contractor. But it's very relevant here. Sustainability is another interesting one. Uh, there are three pillars of sustainability, or depending on where you look up, there's four. People, planet and profits, economic, social, sorry, environmental and social. Those are the three pillars. But uh, before you go filling in the question on sustainability, uh, Google it and have a careful think about what you're putting down, because uh, it's more than just, yeah, uh, I work sustainably, I've cascaded material from a main line into a siding renewal. It's a lot more than that. Ethics, we've talked about ethics. Part of the ethics is actually supporting the PWI. Uh, I, I would be looking in an application uh, to see how you supported the, the PWI. Have you come along to the meetings? Uh, the local meetings. I appreciate over the last two years it's been difficult, but it's actually been easier to attend uh, selected on online meetings. Have you volunteered perhaps to be a member of the uh, local section committee? I think most of the local sections in Glasgow is no exception, is crying out for younger members to come and join us and give us a fresh outlook. Uh, the code of conduct is, is another interesting question. Please, 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 in your answer put, I have read the Permanent Way Institution's code of conduct because it's the PWI's code of conduct we're interested in, we're not interested in your employers. The two may be uh, very similar, but PWI. Uh, most importantly, answer the questions. And when you're answering the questions, just think, uh, did you actually do what you said? Uh, because that's a bear trap waiting to catch people out. I've had what I've seen, seen one where uh, an applicant has said, yeah, uh, I thought I could uh, improve the SNC renewal process by drilling the bond holes out at uh, the factory, this is an innovation that I introduced last year. Uh, no laddie, we did that under early deployment 10 years before. Do you understand the process that you're talking about? Again, I've had something passed, I've had 
more than one thing past me from a project engineer saying, yeah, I uh, review the contractor's designs. Uh, I check the designs and I prepare a DRN. And the DRN I use to express my preferences and the preferences of the RAM. Whoa, no, that's not what the process is about. The process is quite, quite different. And never include in your report anything that you cannot be confident uh, to discuss at an appropriate level at an interview. Before moving on to talking about uh, the review process, let's talk about the sponsor. The sponsor is has an absolutely key role to play. They should be working with you from when you start to prepare your submission to review it, discuss it, to point you in the right direction. Uh, they have the formal role of verifying work-based evidence, and they need to be satisfied with the quality of the submission, including the layout, the content, and the standard of English. At the end of the day, they are your gatekeeper. Now, uh, moving on to the review process itself, we'll look at EngTech first, because it is different from the, 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 the other two uh, forms of registration. It's a written submission, on the PWI forum, which in case you can pick up off the internet. And basically, uh, what you're being asked for is a career summary, not a CV, a career summary, uh, and a response to the competence and commitment questions. Uh, and of course, you can support those responses with the supporting documents, up to 12 A4 sheets plus three A3 drawings. Uh, I would suggest to you that you look and consider carefully what you're going to use for drawings because if you've got a, a really detailed AO drawing that you feel is absolutely critical uh, to support your, your report, it's not going to be legible to me on an A3 sheet. So have a wee think about that one. Uh, we'll also look for your CPD record and development plan. So once your application has been processed, Two trained uh, PWI registered engineers will independently review it. And I'm stressing this here, we'll independently review it. Uh, the reviewers will make their judgments based solely on the information you provide to them. So it's really, really important that you provide as much information as you possibly can within the set parameters on that forum. It may be that we want some further information to determine the application, and you would then be asked for that. Uh, the reviewers will, as I said, independently review the material provided. There's 15 different uh, competency criteria there, and we will score them uh, from zero to five. Basically, zero is no knowledge, and five is know-how. We are required to justify each of the scores that is recorded. Now, at the end of the day, it's uh, a method that uh, can be repeated, can be audited. So what, 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 we, what we do is we total up your score. Uh, you need to reach a certain numeric value with your score, but also you must there must be no zeros in the scoring. For each block, your block's A to E, you must have a minimum mean score of two. And for question E2, which is a safety question, you must score three. So uh, from that, we then individually provide a recommendation to the PWI's registration manager. Basically, does the reviewer agree that EngTech competence and commitment requirements are met by the qualifications, the candidates' professional development and the competency questions, yes or no? Now, this is the first time that the two reviewers will discover what, how they have scored it. If we're not in agreement, if one says yes and the other says no, we will be sent away for the first time to speak together and have a, a professional discussion to try and reach an agreement. In the case of a borderline result, the reviewers may ask the candidate to provide some more information uh, or to review their responses to specific uh, questions. The reviewers' final recommendations are then passed to the membership committee. 
for I engine C engine is a slightly different process. Uh, there is a written submission on the PWI forum, again available online. Uh, you'll provide a career summary. You'll provide a brief response to the competency and commitment questions, but these will be cross-referenced to your professional report. Uh, you will prepare a professional report and supply supporting documents, your CPD record and your development plan. Now, once you've submitted this, it's subject to a two-stage review. Firstly, two trained registered engineers will independently, again stressing independently, scrutinise uh, the application to confirm that there is sufficient evidence of the criteria being met to progress to interview. The scrutineers will also provide the reviewers with suggested areas to probe during the interview. You will then be asked to attend the professional interview with two further PWI trained registered engineers. The report, uh, what we're looking for is around 5,000 words describing your experience, responsibilities and expertise to provide uh, evidence and clear examples of how each of the competencies have been met. The report needs to be mapped to the competencies in your application forum. You'll refer to uh, sections and pages of the report. It's also a good idea to uh, have a annotation on your report to point out which competency or competencies you are talking about. Now, you will, I'm sure a lot of you will work for employers who've got wonderful report templates and really, really good, clear report templates. Please use them, but take your employer's header off, take the logo off, take the word that says official off the top, because it's your, it's your report, it's not theirs. Uh, the number that you see coming through, you just cringe and you go, no, no, no. This is an individual's report, it's not a company report. Again, never include in your report anything that you can't confidently discuss at an appropriate level at interview. Now, the scrutineers uh, report, that's an independent review, the scrutineers sit totally separately and they will advise if each competency criteria has been met or addressed. Basically, there's three answers they can give to each one. Yes, maybe, or no. And uh, the final conclusion that they reach is, is the candidate ready for interview? In the case that they feel the candidate is necessarily ready for interview, they may suggest a resubmission of the report and uh, give positive feedback to help you with that. So assuming we've got past that hurdle, I, the, we now go on to the, the pre-interview stage. Two reviewers are selected, as I said earlier on, uh, matched as near as possible uh, to the, the, the candidate. We will be provided with all the documents, including the scrutineer's report in advance, probably about two weeks in advance of the actual interview. And here, the two reviewers will discuss and agree uh, prior to the interview an outline question plan. Now, what this is not is this is not a, a decision as to be who's going to be good cop and bad cop. We don't play good cop and bad cop at the interview uh, because we want you to pass. We want to help you on your way. So it's not good cop, bad cop. We do this to try and make the best possible use of the limited time that we have. The interview itself uh, will be of 60 to 70 minutes duration. And uh, since the advent of COVID, the interviews are held online. And this is actually probably a, a good thing. One of the few good things that's come out of the, the pandemic is that we've now gone to virtual interviews. Previously, we held our interviews in London and I think occasionally Birmingham. Uh, so the thought of having to trail down from Scotland to London for a one hour interview, pretty daunting. 
Uh, and for a reviewer like me, if I've got a morning interview in London, I've probably travelled down in the sleeper overnight, and I'll probably be a grump because I've not had a good night's sleep. So I think we've got a positive here. We're doing it online. Now, the participants in the interview, in theory, there are three. There's you, most important guy, uh, or person, and your two reviewers. However, there may be other people present in this virtual world, uh, none of whom will take an active part in either the interview or in making the decision after the interview. Uh, again, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing that we're doing this now uh, virtually because sitting there with five people on the other side of the table, that is really going to be off-putting. So the, the, the other people who may be involved in the interview or present at the interview, should I say, is a reviewer under training. So somebody there uh, that's had the training but has not uh, been involved in any interviews. So they will sit there uh, and they will play no part in the questioning. They will play no part in the discussion afterwards uh, until we have reached a decision or a recommendation. After that, they may ask a few questions to help them uh, saying, well, wh why did you do this? Why did you do that? But they say they will not influence the decision in our recommendation in any way. The institution's technical director uh, may be present and his role in the interview is the auditing of people like me, auditing reviewers. So we are all subject to audit every couple of years. Again, he will take no part in the questioning, he will take no part in the discussion, he will take no part in our deliberations after the meeting. Uh, he will then give the reviewers feedback, uh, either positive or a right good boot in the backside. Uh, and finally, there may be a representative of the Engineering Council, uh, again, like the technical director, they are there to audit the PWI's process and they will play no part whatsoever in the interview or in the uh, decision making process. So the interview itself starts off with introductions. Uh, you will be asked to give a presentation exploring a, a technical engineering topic or a safety initiative that you have led or have had significant involvement in. A very short presentation, 10 minutes only. Uh, that will lead to some questions but then we will go into the questions and discussions based on what you have written in your report so that we can perhaps tease out some areas that perhaps appear weak, but you're really knowledgeable in. Uh, and in conclusion of the interview, uh, we will ask you if we missed anything. Is there anything else that you would like to tell us that uh, perhaps we've, we've not asked through questioning. And you will also be asked if you are happy with our conduct of the interview, because it's very important that uh, you are happy with the way we have conducted that interview. Post the interview, I, the reviewers will discuss, likely sim similarly to, 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 to EngTech, uh, and we'll score each of the 15 competency criteria. Again, similar uh, format uh, with if you like, a, a different uh, base score. Again, we will have to record a justification, not just give a score, but justify why. Uh, and we do that together. At the end of the day, we provide a recommendation to the PWI's membership committee recommending either you are elected as an incorporated or chartered engineer or in the very, very rare case that we would decline to, to recommend your, your election. Uh, your application and review will then be considered by the membership committee and they will make the decision yes or no. If sadly your, your application is not successful, the reason for that decision will be fully explained to you and you, you'll be given guidance as to how you may wish to address the concern raised and hopefully reapply at a later date. Uh, hopefully uh, that has given a reasonably brief overview 
of uh, what happens at the professional interview, some of the pitfalls, some helpful hints. Thank you for your attention. Again, I'll be quite happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Jim, and and indeed Brian. Um, we don't have any questions at the moment in the chat, so if any, anyone wants to ask anything, you can either chuck it into the chat or even just um, we can just go to if you want to stick your hand up and we can open the floor to uh, questions. If anyone's got any, oh, I yeah, see one no. one already. Sorry, I think Sweep, are you? Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Absolutely brilliant, Jim, and also Brian. Thank you for that. Um, my question is on obviously sustainability. Um, it's a big factor at the moment. I mean, you, I mean, you probably have got probably have probably have done some couple of tasks on sustainability. But when you're looking at the social, you know, you're looking at people. Uh, you know, how how would I able to <coughs> uh, justify that as a as an answer? So if I'm going ahead to do my eye engine, if I was a part of the sustainability what part would match that as a track designer, for example? Um, I mean, are we looking at material components? I mean, I've never had looked at components, but how would I justify that in terms of sustainability? Uh, Jim, do you want to say, shall I say a few things, uh, Jim, and then do you want to add to it? Yeah, yeah, that'll be fine, Brian, yes. Yeah. Um, you're right, absolutely right. Sustainability is a really big issue uh, at the moment. And um, I think, you know, you, you, you've, you're very lucky that you actually, the, the, the last, uh, was it the Glasgow COP was held in December, was it last year? That um, on, on uh, environmental issues and things like that. So you've got that part of it already in the background. But when you're looking at um, at, at actually what you provide it could be that you've got some ideas yourself about what could be developed to uh, improve sustainability to improve whole life cost of when you're looking at a, an item or whatever i think it's actually more about for when you when you're apply, when you're going for registration it's a, more about your understanding personally so it may be that um, you, you know you've got some ideas and they haven't gone anywhere but you've raised it with people and you are prepared to uh, to um, provide the client or, or what, whoever with options and if they choose not to take it but you are aware of it it's, it's your showing your awareness and what can be done to improve the sustainability of track or or even just the railway the whole railway itself perfect brian and and one of the examples was that back in back in february where i went down to manchester for the pwi was it the decarbonization and the climate change seminar where they talked all about this um, sustainability. I mean, a lot of the topics that came out from it, especially with the network rail industry, how they're organising and how they're going forward with the, with the sustainability feature. So one of those could obviously tick my com competence um, by attending one of the seminars in PWR last month. So a lot of a lot of lot of information came out from that, which could be which could tick the bottom. But no, thank you very much, Brian. Your um, views are important, you see. It's, it's your person. If you came across at interviews saying, these are things I've come across, these are what I've attended, and this is what I believe. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, as a designer, uh, some of the things you could be looking at sustainability-wise is uh, perhaps going for different track forms. Uh, for example, uh, you could say, well, I thought about using something different. I thought about a ballastless track forum uh, because if you're using less aggregate, uh, it perhaps can be installed by less skilled labour uh, and having less land take. So there, there, there's lots of things that as a designer you, you, you can actually wind in there. Uh, but I think it's very important that before you answer a sustainability question, Google Google sustainability and, and you, you, you'll see the pillars there and that will help guide you. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. Tom, I think you are next. If you're... I'll put my hand up and it looks as though it's Jim, but I'm actually shouting from the <laughs> yeah. So uh, a couple of things I wanted to raise. So if you, if you just let me have my head when you get fed up, just say. The first one's an observation rather than a question. 
and it was something that Brian touched on and he was talking about employers these days require some sort of engineering council accreditation uh, as a mark of competence. And that's basically because there is no industry recognised in the, the real industry, recognised competence standard to be measured against. And therefore, if you want to be recognised for your competence, your knowledge and performance ability, then being recognised by the Engineering Council is the way to do it. And when you're recognised at whatever grade or level you go for the Engineering Council, that's a mark of who you are. Mm. Uh, my question was, again, something that, on, that Brian was talking about when he was talking about UK spec. And we're on the fourth edition of the UK spec. Uh, and I was, my question was, does do you think, Brian, that the PWI should have some sort of attribute mapping tool. I've got an attribute mapping tool that I use for my team of designers, and it basically tells them that when they look as potential candidates at the Engineering Council UK spec, they look at the attributes but can't immediately relate what they do in their day-to-day -day work with some of the attributes. In other words, the attributes are there, they are marked, some examples are given of what that might look like, but not very specific to the particular branch of real engineering that they're on with. In my case, it's track engineering. So what I've done is I've got a mapping tool that says, OK, criterion A1 is this, and you should be looking to achieve this and this, and this is how you'll do it. So it might be preparing a simple line diagram in CAD might meet criterion A1, if that was a particular criterion. So I'm quite happy to share my version of that with you, Brian, or the PWI, if you think that might have legs to help potential candidates in the future relate a bit better what they do as a day job to what the Engineering Council attributes look like. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea, Tom. Um, I, I think um, probably the best person to share it with is, is, is Liz Turner the registration um, manager because um, it, it it can then be considered by uh, the, the the other members of the membership or academic panel uh, because we can actually put it on the website as a, an exemplar or whatever that people can use but before we need to do that we'd we'd need to go through it ourselves but I think it's a great idea obviously because for example for overhead lane engineers some of the attributes I've got they might never do Right, so you would have to do it for different branches of yeah, engineering. yeah, yeah. Track engineering, overhead line engineering, E and P yeah. engineering. You could you could tailor it to suit the people that we will be looking at in PWI as being potential engineering council accreditees. And it, and it could be, as I say, it could be used as an exemplar of how you would do it or how you've explained to others to do it, and then people could use that as their as a skeleton for how they might do it themselves in whatever part of the profession they are in. And it may help people like Schwab, who's looking at, you know, the competent, the, uh, sorry, the sustainability pillars and saying, uh -huh. Uh -huh. how does what I do in my day job meet a sustainability pillar? And of course, what Jack, what Jim mentioned is the, the, uh, the different type of track form. And if, if we manage to persuade our client to accept a, uh, a steel sleeper track form rather than a concrete sleeper track form, yep. then that's a good example of a sustainability, a more sustainable solution. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another question that I had was, quite along similar lines, I also have a report writing skill, something similar to what uh, Jim was talking about, um, but actually helps avoid the pitfalls in report writing and things that you wouldn't normally want to see. So as well as doing the spell check, just a bit more about the structure, and I'm happy to share that if the PWI might benefit themselves from having a report writing guide to say, you know, structure your report this way, have a beginning, middle and an end, think about how you're going to set out your paragraphs, have it in a logical order. It's just a bit more than just a kind of bullet list about how you would do it, as well as avoid things to avoid. Never say, for example, um, in order to, when you really just want to say to do something. 
I think, you know, all these things are, are very important um, and, and will assist people. Absolutely no doubt about that, Tom. Um, when we're talking about report here, we're talking about the, the person's experience. And so, so the, the actual, the grammatical part of what you're describing there is, very, is, is, is really key to how you put a lot of us. Uh, you know, didn't get the experience when we were younger to, to actually do reports. But the main key point uh, is to go back to on this one is what Jim started with. It's about I. It's about what they did and putting it into a beginning, a middle and an end is is really important and gets across the the um, the issues and what they did in, in it. But what we what we don't want to get and I'm sure Jim will support me on this. We don't want reports on technical stuff because that's what we read all the time. What we want, this is a report about your experience and what you've done. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely Brian. Yes. Uh, that, that is one of the, you know, to everybody, uh, and Jim's, uh, you know, he, he made it very plain at the start there. It, it's very difficult for us because we're we're not used to saying I did this, I did that. Oh, you know, we, we, what that's really what, what in a in a in a polite way we would say this is what I did on this particular job, and it may not have been that much, but it's what you did, and we we could we we can see that you understood it, and pulling that together in a decent report is very important. Uh, so knowing the criteria that Tom's just been going about the beginning and middle and end proper grammar is is really is really important. But I, I mustn't you mustn't get away from the fact it's about you. And being able to map that back to the engineering council's attributes. Yeah. Say this meets criteria in D2 part yep. C. Yeah. 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 That's, that's what I mean then. Um, and, and this is maybe a question that other people on the call might want to ask, and I'll call it for older members of uh, the PWI. Yeah. How far back should the CPD record extend in a submission? So, so for somebody going through the experiential route, let's say it was me, might only be able to recall retrospectively CPD events over the last, say, three years and, and have some kind of evidence for doing that. But even though I've been doing CPD all of my career, and my my uh, the way I live is every day is a school day, and the people that know me know that I, that's how I live. So yeah, I've been doing CPD every day, effectively, but just not recording it very well. I have yeah. some early records. I have some recent records. But how far back would you expect someone doing the experiential route to be able to claim the 30 hours per annum CPD? Um, well... I think it, it's written down. It's it was three years. It might be just two years for chartered now. I'm not actually sure. It's two or three years. It's one it's one year for Eng Tech, yeah. Um, but when you're actually applying for experiential, um, you you may be referring to something you did five ten years ago, uh, right? Um, and and um, you, you know you, you you show calculations that you did five ten years ago or whatever, and that's 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 the ev that's all the evidence we need. We don't need to see any further back into when you first started on the rail or anything like that. Um, the important thing with CPD is what you learnt, is what you is you is your reflection on what you did, what you 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 know you attended tonight. And perhaps one of the things that you picked up tonight was actually I didn't realise that it was only an hour long the review or something like that. These sort of it's what those those are important parts of CPD. But to, to answer your question, John, you, you're not expected to go back ten years, five years in your CPD, but you may want to go that far back in some of the examples that you use if you're doing experiential. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to shut up there and let other people have a <laughs> good questions. Good questions. So, so we had one on the, the chat there from David Lindsay who's, who's asking, it was mentioned at the start that it may be possible to have one to one guidance on path to registration if the route isn't obvious. How how does he go about that? Um, you know, I've been doing this for, for some time. The route is not obvious <laughs> quite, a bit, <laughs> quite a few times, actually. <laughs> it is. It's it can be it can seem like a great big forest, but it isn't. 
and, and I think one to one guidance is really important. And um, I, I'm, I'm happy to give one to one guidance on the routes to registration uh, and either they can contact me directly or, 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 or through through uh, you, Greg, I, I don't mind, uh, you know, um, but we just do it over the um, over, over the Internet or, or, or whatever. Um, so I'm more than happy to do that. I'm sure Jim would as well. But, um, uh, you know, yeah. I, I do recommend it's it's not it, it may seem like a forest. It isn't. And, and we can show you routes through it. But every the, but nearly but everybody's can be different. Yeah, but there is a route for everybody. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have a generic email for the Glasgow section, but I just don't have it to hand. But I can maybe get it on the chat. Well, or shall, shall I put my email it. address in the chat room? Uh, yeah, sure. If, if you're happy to do that. Yeah. Just, Great. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't mind having a one to one with people. Excellent. Yeah. Sure. Has that helped with that question? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Brian. Just get in touch, no problem. Great. Yeah, the Glasgow one's just been added. Thank you. Yeah, good, good. That's great. Yeah, both are on there. Excellent. Any, any further questions from anyone at all? Either if you want to type in the chat or or speak freely. Does anybody feel ready to apply now? OK. Um, you know, when I've done these, when it's been uh, on in, in, in person, uh, often the, one of the questions gets raised is, how do you get the time for all this? You know, I'm doing a full time job at work. I've got four kids at home that are crying when they get in. Um, and how do I how am I going to get around to doing this? And you remember on one of the actual slides there, I said, I think it said was have a plan. And really, I would recommend that, you know, just sit aside for 10 minutes after now and say, look, you know, I'm, I think I really ought to get this sorted out uh, and and say to yourself, look at the, go on the website and look at the steps that I've described today. You can see it from the presentation, but you can see there's one of the pages on, on the website registration, which says routes to membership. And you can actually, you know, put a request in to say, this is what my, my, um, my academic qualifications are. Can you advise my best route or something like that? Or give me a shout and we can talk it through. But I would suggest that you you've seen what Jim said. You've seen what we're supposed to you've got to fill in. Just work out what you think it would take to do it if you started tomorrow. And then you can spread the time out and work it around what you're doing and don't beat yourself up if you don't reach a certain point by a certain time but have little goals on the way to get there because i i'm convinced the fact that you've all come on tonight that you all want to do it the difficulty is when you go out and go home and you go to work the next day there's so many things can get in the way of that but just make sure you've got that little plan with those little goals that will take you those those next steps yeah um that's so important because otherwise uh it, it can get very frustrated by it but you yeah. can all do it you can all do it you're absolutely right brian what is a good thing to do is say don't look at this as a big problem it's just a lot of little problems so you yeah. write down, even just saying what would my report outline look like i would have an introduction i would talk a bit about this early career yeah. I would reference it back to some attributes. I would put in another bit about. So just, just kind of, and even if all you did that very first week was have a report skeleton, not a single word written other than the headings. Yeah. And you can tackle those headings one by one. And and already you're thinking about the time scale it will take to do each of those headings and the kind of thing that you would expect to be writing in them. Absolutely. It, 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 you know, it, look, it can look scary, but after you've started it, you'll realise I can do this. Engtech, 
you know, you can probably do it in a weekend. But don't beat yourself up if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, involve your sponsor. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we're all keen for you to get this to get through these processes. You know, it's it's for a real benefit to you, as, as Tom was saying there. Um, and, you know, we're, we're everybody's keen to help you. I think one of the benefits hasn't been actually vocalised tonight. And I speak as someone who went through the uh, experiential route with ICE, only to be uh, reviewed by two people, two engineers with the ICE, with absolutely no idea what I was talking about when I was talking about rail sourcing. And at least if you go through PWI as a rail engineer, the overhead line, P way, whatever it is, you'll be being reviewed by people who know what you're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I'm just just conscious of our time. Is there any, mm. can I make a, a last call for any any further and final questions before we close it out or? OK. Last chance. <laughs> OK, I'll just I'll just move on there just to finally give a, a, a vote of thanks to our speakers tonight. Um, so I'm not going to say too much um, without repeating your whole presentation. I was taking <laughs> loads of notes throughout it. Um, so uh, excellent presentation that really helps unlock the process. Um, as we mentioned, it can seem a bit overwhelming and daunting to people on how to even get started. So it was great that you, you both clearly laid out you know, the first steps initially and, and the crucial requirements for a supporter and sponsor, um, the difference in the requirements for each grade, qualifications and everything that forms part of the application process. And, and Jim, you also gave some really valuable tips there um, that aren't written down anywhere. So they are they're, they're mm. gems, I would say. Um, I'm so glad it's recorded as well because it's definitely something people will want to go back to and watch and pick out those key parts relevant to their application and their journey through the process so i'll just finish with that i'll just say you know on behalf of the members and, and everyone in the audience thanks very much for your talk tonight and if everyone can come off mute and try and give the the vote of thanks in the <laughs> usual manner thanks very much thank you so, yeah.